research. That's why I give you sources and documentation so that you don't have to take my word for anything. However, folks, the reaction to this, even among some prominent liberals like Kenneth Goodman, past president of the International Reading Association, has been to question national standards. After er Ernest Boyer made the statement that I just quoted, Goodman wrote a column in which he pronounced, quote, I accuse the politicians and technicians of the standards movement of using standards as a cover for a well-orchestrated attempt to centralize power and thus control who will teach, who will learn, what will be taught in the nation's schools, and who will determine the curriculum for schools and for teacher education. The standards movement promises the political power brokers, ladies and gentlemen, that by controlling outcomes, they can control schools while appearing to support local control. Be very, very careful. That's from Education Week, September 7th, 1994. You see, nothing's hidden. It's all out in the open. You just don't have access to the information like I do. And that's why we have this broadcast. This kind of duplicious strategy of paying lip service to local control while actively undermining it was even admitted to by national standards advocate Dr. Richard Elmore at a National Education Goals Panel, in EGP meeting, earlier this year. Elmore stated, quote, Once you start to be able to collect data on individual schools and benchmark performance and content from the state level against state, national, and international standards, you break the traditional grip of the local administrators and boards, whether you want to or not. I mean... You're going to do this saying all along the way we're in favor of local control, etc. The accountability is going to go straight from the state to the school once that starts to happen, end quote. You see how sneaky they are? You see what liars they are? They plan to deceive you, and they do it every day. Ernest Boyer is now deceased. He had been head of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching even cursory research, folks, reveals that various tax-exempt Carnegie entities are heavily involved in today's educational restructuring. For example, the chairman of the National Test Panel developing the national test to which President Clinton referred is Wilmer Cody, who is also on the governing board of the New Standards Project, a creation of Carnegie's National Center on Education and the Economy. Another member of the National Test Panel is Eddie Davis with the National Education Association, who is also a member of the Carnegie-created National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. Among those who are opposing the movement toward national education standards is Congressman William Goodley, who on August 1, 1997, along with 22 co-sponsors, introduced House Resolution 214. This bill seeks to mandate, quote, that the Department of Education should suspend any and all planning, development, implementation, or administration of any national testing proposal in reading, mathematics, or any other subject area until Congress provides specific, explicit... This bill seeks to mandate, quote, that the Department of Education should suspend any and all planning, development, implementation, or administration of any national testing proposal in reading, mathematics, or any other subject area until Congress provides specific, explicit, statutory authority, end quote. The resolution was offered as an amendment to House Bill 2264, an education appropriations bill. Never mind the fact, ladies and gentlemen, that the federal government does not have the authority granted by the Constitution to mandate that your schools or your school districts do anything whatsoever. You know how they get you to do it? They dangle money in front of your nose, and you think money is the answer. If money is the answer, why is it, ladies and gentlemen, that when our children went to little one-room red schoolhouses 
in the pioneer days of this country where the teacher was paid room and board and a very, very small stipend for personal needs and grades one through eight all sat in the same room and were taught concurrently, why is it that those children knew more, were smarter and better educated than the children who graduate from a modern high school today? Why is it that every one of those children could read on what today would be considered a fourth-year college level? Why is it that every one of those children excelled in mathematics? Why is it that every one of those children knew the true and correct history of this country and of the world? Can any of you answer those questions? Just recently, I attended a meeting at the Round Valley High School where the teenage Republicans brought in one of our Arizona senators. And uh, during that meeting, when the senator finished his talk, he opened the floor to questions. One of the school faculty, I don't know if it was a teacher or one of the administrative staff in the back raised his hand, wanted to know when they were going to get more money so that they could raise the standing of the tests of the students of the state of Arizona. Now, I was sitting in the front row and I couldn't see who it was, ladies and gentlemen, but I'll tell you right now, whoever it was had the wrong idea about children and what they learn and how they learn it. In the Round Valley, we have one of the best high school buildings and schools that you can imagine. I mean, it's really beautiful. It's modern. It's, uh, it's up to date with just about anything that you can compare it with. Now, I don't know whether it is on the cutting edge of technology. I don't know if they have a computer so that every student can plug into the Internet. And quite frankly, don't care. Because plugging into the Internet has absolutely nothing to do with whether those students learn what they need to learn to be successful in life. 